Shoshana Zuboff, thank you very much for coming into the studio. Um, it's I think an it's, honor. Thanks for having me. There's a lot to talk about, so let's try and you know unpeel this onion um, yes, as much as we can. Someone who was very kind about your book, and lots of people have been very kind about it, said that it 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 makes us aware of the kind of things that we should be aware of but haven't been so far. What should we be aware of? I think we should be aware of that the digital world that has formed itself around us and the road to a digital future that we're on right now is something that has been hijacked by what I regard as a rogue economic logic that I call, of course, surveillance capitalism. The surveillance capitalists have tried to get us to believe that their practices are the inevitable outgrowth of digital technologies. If we want digital, then we have to go along with their surveillance operations and the consequences of those operations. And we're talking about Google, we're, we're talking, talking about, about Facebook. Yes, Google and Facebook are the pioneers. Amazon and Microsoft have piled on. But really, over the last 20 years, surveillance capitalism, it first became the default economic model in the tech sector, but now we see it moving through the normal economy. You know, wh whether you look at insurance, education, healthcare, retail, real estate, even right back into manufacturing and basic services, we're seeing companies all over the economy now chasing what they perceive to be as that magical surveillance dividend. You know, how you get those margins in a world of intense global competition. And when you say that magical surveillance dividend, are you talking about basically our innermost thoughts, you know, as much information about how we tick what makes us tick as possible? Well, so here's how surveillance capitalism works, just in brief. <laughs> you know, it begins with <coughs> these companies claiming, unilaterally claiming, our private human experience as their free source of raw material. So what do they do with that raw material? They lift out of it the rich predictive signals in our behavior, and they turn that into data. These behavioral data, you can think of it as a complex set of pipes, supply chains. So the behavioral data now is scraped from our experience, it goes into the supply chains, then it gets tipped onto the conveyor belts and right into the new factories. What happens in those factories? Where well, that's where we talk about things like artificial intelligence, mm. machine intelligence. The new factories are computational. But give us a practical example of how that data is being harvested and then how is it being used in order to, let's say, make us buy certain things that we might actually not want to buy. Absolutely. So, what comes out the other end of the factory? Well, we always know factories make products. So what's coming out of these factories are products that predict our behavior. They are computational products mm -hmm. that predict what we will do soon and later. And they're not, even though they are about us, they're not for us. They're not sold to us. They're not meant to enhance our own lives. They're sold to business customers who want uh, a leg up on what we're going to do in the future. So here's an example. Uh, we know that, for example, right now in London, there's a lot of discussion about the CCTV cameras everywhere who are taking everybody's faces without their knowledge, therefore without their permission and so on. And there, there's a lot of controversy about this. But what everyone needs to know is that the tech companies the private sphere has fought for the right to take our faces from any kind of public space, to take our faces off have the Have they web. got that right? They have. Well, certainly in the US, they have that right. They have unilaterally claimed the right. And no government in the US, all during the years of the Obama administration and since then, no government has obstructed that right. So anywhere that you are in a public space, certainly in the US, the tech companies can take your face. Why do they want your face so badly? Well, first of all, 
obviously, it's very important to know who's doing what and where they're going and where they are and, and so forth. But there are even deeper reasons. There are many, many muscles in the face, and those muscles can combine into hundreds of different kinds of gestures. They do facial recognition analysis to compute those gestures because those gestures predict emotion. And once they know what you're feeling, that becomes one of the most powerful predictors of your behavior. Now, that kind of behavioral insight is sold to business customers. So, for example, we know about a Facebook document that was leaked to the press in Australia, written by Facebook executives to their Australian and New Zealand business customers. And what do they sell them in this document? They say, we have so much detailed data on behavior and emotion from 6.4 million young teenage and young adult people who live in New Zealand and Australia. And through this intense depth and range of data, we know their emotional cycles through every day and through the week. But is that actually true or is that just a boast? Well, it appears to be true. I mean, you know, someday we'll get into Facebook and we'll do the forensics mm. and because we'll have the law to allow us to do that. Right now, uh, from everything we know and everything we can triangulate, it appears to be true because it dovetails with the findings of researchers who have, academic researchers indeed, who have been developing these very capabilities literally since the year 2008, 2009, 2010, where these kinds of um, data capture, data analysis, translating into emotional and behavioral insights that predict future behavior, we know that these capabilities exist and have been proven. So this facial recognition technology that you talk about goes way beyond what Cambridge Analytica was trying to do, for instance, doesn't it? Well, Cambridge Analytica was, as you know, a small firm. We're still trying to figure out exactly what it did do. But even those things we know, what it suggests is that this little firm was a parasite and it was the parasite on a much larger host. Face value, it looks like that much larger host was Facebook. But what we know is that Facebook is a pioneer surveillance capitalist. Essentially, 97% of Facebook's revenues come from its online targeted advertising markets, which are wholly owned and operated in this surveillance capitalist economic logic. So, Cambridge Analytica is a parasite on the host of surveillance capitalism. All of its mechanisms and methods, all of its data, all derive from surveillance capitalism, simply pivoting those operations a few degrees from trying to acquire guaranteed commercial outcomes, achieving mm -hmm. guaranteed commercial outcomes for business customers to instead trying to achieve guaranteed political, political outcomes, outcomes. Yeah. for a political customer, if mm. you will. In this case, a secretive software billionaire mm. who owned that company and was using it to manipulate the public for his political aims. So it's the same business model, but one is about getting you to buy stuff and the other one is about getting you to vote in a certain direction. To vote in a certain way, to think in a certain way, to align yourself with certain groups, to read certain kinds of materials. And yes, ultimately, in order to add momentum uh, to a political point of view, to the point of actually voting. Isn't the success of surveillance capitalism also that we are the willing accomplices. We want to be able to go online. We don't mind having Netflix or Amazon predict what we want to buy because they can glean our tastes. Isn't that the case? Well, there, It's convenient for us. Yes, there, there's so many pieces to this. So let me just say a couple of things. I feel very loving and generous toward us. When I ask the question- That's good to know. <laughs> when I ask the question, you know, how did they get away with it? Mm. I come up with 16 answers, and I won't try to go through all the 16. Some are historical, structural, but some have to do with how we have been bamboozled 
and exploited, all right? You mentioned the word convenience. Look, we've all lived through the last four to five decades of, of real economic oppression, growing income inequality, family, family incomes have not really moved since the mm. 1970s. We're all under tremendous pressure. Everybody in the family is working. A lot of people are working more than one job. So the time pressure and the stress in our families is enormous as a result of the economic policies of these past decades. So do we need convenience? You bet we do. Do we need ways to save time and help ourselves and help our families? You bet we do. So this is these needs are being exploited. So that's number one. Number two is, these companies that we're talking about, as you know, have become very wealthy companies. Literally, the wealthiest co companies in, in the history of commerce. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this capital, this private surveillance capital, has gone to work creating systems that are intentionally hidden from us, that are designed to keep us in ignorance. Ergo, surveillance Give me an capitalism. Yeah. Well, really from the start, I'm talking about these rich predictive signals. Mm. We live in the illusion that we are making a private calculation. I'll give Facebook or Google or, or Amazon this little bit of data, and in return I get this service, which is very useful. Often it's even free. Mm. So that seems like a private calculation that's worth making. What we don't understand, two things. One is that we think we're, we know what we're giving them, but it's not the case. They are taking so much from what we give them that we have no idea about. For example, you're making plans on Facebook for your family and friends to have dinner this evening. They don't care about what you write. They care about, do you use exclamation points? Do you use bullet points? When you make plans... Why? Why do they care about that? Because those are the predictive signals. Analysts have shown that you can take these kinds of signals, whether you say, for example, I'll see you later or I'll see you at 745 at the corner of Oxford and Regent Streets. Do I have that right? Mm. These are indications of the kind of personality that you have translated into what's called the five factor personality test. Mm. And with that personality test, other kinds of things can be inferred. Your sexual orientation, your political orientation, all kinds of things about yourself that you never intended to disclose. And these kinds of predictive, predictive signals are being hunted and captured not only all over the internet and, and, and the trail that you've left online, but now throughout the real world. Where are you? Where are, your, where are you going? What apps do you have on your phone? Those apps can be capturing not only your location on a constant mm. basis, but your contacts, your messages. Some of them capture your phone, some of them, I but mean, your, I, your, so your camera, some of them capture your microphone. But if I, you know, my kids have all got these supercomputers, you know. In their pockets. In their pockets, in their hands, constantly on them. If I told them what you've just told me, that, you know, the price for having this is that your information, your most personal information, is being put together by someone like a puzzle and they know all about you. That's the price. Or you give this thing up and you use a landline and you just read books. I think they'd probably go for the former. They'd say, OK, if that's the price of having the supercomputer in my hands, I'll live with it. And this gets back to the earlier question. We are accomplices in this. We are willing accomplices, which is you know, great for the business model of these tech giants, but also means that we, you know, we are quite happy to hand over all this data. In the battle between convenience and privacy, convenience seems to be winning. Well, again, let me emphasize, it, it does seem to be winning, but there are other reasons for this. One is that most of us have almost no understanding of what is going on backstage. These operations are deeply designed to be hidden from us. That's one reason why I spent so many years writing this book, Matt, because I wanted to be able to at least lift the veil on a good deal mm. of this information so that we have an idea of what these backstage operations really are. And 
And a second thing is that over the 20 years since surveillance capitalism was invented early in the 2000s and has now disseminated through the economy, this, this logic has had a free run. Uh, are Virtually no regulation. Unimpeded by law, yeah. Matt. Unimpeded by regulation. What that Why means, is that, by the way, do you think? Well, let me, let me just okay. finish this thought and I'll come back to that. What that means is that it has disseminated through so many sectors so that our, fault, all, our alternatives have largely been foreclosed. It used to be that surveillance capitalism owned and operated just a piece of the internet. But now surveillance capitalism owns and operates virtually everything we do on the internet. Every interface with a quote smart product or a personalized service. We have that computer in our pocket. So anywhere we are and any app that we're interacting with, even now, you know, driving in our cars, the smart dashboard, being in our homes with Internet of Things, smart appliances, smart television, smart refrigerator, all of these things are saturating us and surrounding us, the devices and cameras in the streets, so that we are increasingly trapped in a world of no escape. And even if we want to make a choice, we can't. That was going to be our next question. You know, if, if, are there only two choices here? You're either completely, you know, entrapped in that ecosystem of information, of surveillance, or you're completely outside it, you know, like living in the forest. Is there something in between? I mean, can I choose to be part of it up to a point and, you know, ignore the rest? Well, all right. So, you know, a lot of people put time into what I call hiding in our own lives, right? So there are <laughs> massive discussions about encryption and all mm. the kinds of attachments that you can put on your browser that, that uh, eliminate the trackers and that disguise your location. And so- Do they work? Is, well, some of them work and they work for a time. And you know, what I was just about to say, this is an arms race. Mm. So we try to hide and they try to find us and then we find new ways of hiding. They find new ways of finding us. But the real answer here, Matt, is that this is intolerable. This is unacceptable because we are 21st century citizens. We have been duped into thinking that privacy is a private matter. And that's where your child, you know, feels that he or she can make this private calculation. Well, dad, you know, I'm willing to give up this information mm. because otherwise I, I really can't live an effective life with my friends, with my school, mm. with any of the, the work I that? have to do. The answer to that is privacy is not private. Privacy is social, it is societal, and it is a collective action problem, not an individual problem. How do we solve collective action problems? Matt, we solve them with law. We solve them with democracy. So there is one thing that surveillance capitalists fear. It may not be me as an individual or you as an individual or your son or daughter as an individual, but what they fear is all of us mobilized together now, switched on with our eyes wide open, no longer prey to this bamboozlation that they've become We saw so a little bit of that, didn't we, with years. Facebook and their share price after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. We saw a little bit of it. And now we see, you know, this next phase of bamboozlement. Interesting story. Mark Zuckerberg in April of 2019 is up on the stage announcing to his people, privacy is the future. Right. So all of us, our heads are kind of cracking because, you know, how do we make sense of this strange moment? But then just a month later in June, Facebook's counsel is arguing in a California courtroom where a group of people have brought a class action suit. And the idea of this suit is we want to know from Facebook what is our Facebook data that was shared with Cambridge Analytica that allowed them to target us for political ends, for pernicious political goals. We want those data. And the Facebook counsel is arguing to the judge that anyone who goes on Facebook, likely to be sharing with at least 100 people in a network, has no reasonable expectation of privacy. If you participate in Facebook, 
you have no reasonable expectation of privacy, and therefore you have no standing in a courtroom arguing for privacy. How about that? So if you are vulnerable to bamboozlement, friends, we need to dig deeper, we need to read widely, and we need to understand that this rhetoric of, of misdirection and obfuscation and making things hidden and indecipherable has been one of their key sources of advantage from the very start. Very few of us have that capability of looking at our, mm. looking at other folks with a straight face and just saying something that is not true and not flinching. But they know much more about us. That. They know much more about us than we know about them. Well, this is something extraordinary now because in order to do their business and make money, they have to have great predictions to sell. That means they're selling certainty to their business customers. In order to have predictions that get close to certainty, first of all, they have to have a lot of data. That means what we call economies of scale. They have to have varieties of data. That means economies of scope. And then they've learned that the very best data comes from intervening in our behavior to actually learn how to shove us in a direction that will be convenient for their bottom line. So now they're actually learning how to modify our behavior in ways that are remote and automated and can be scaled. So what, what this has created is something quite extraordinary. Here we are entering the third decade of the 21st century, yeah. expecting this digital century to be the most democratized of all. You mentioned Gutenberg. This is supposed to be the, the uh, rebirth of Gutenberg, but now on steroids, the democratization of knowledge. Instead, what do we have? We enter this decade with an extreme asymmetry of knowledge and the power over our behavior that that knowledge provides. With these companies knowing everything about us, and us knowing so little about them. I want to ask you about democracy in a minute, but just briefly, the way you describe it very clearly makes me wonder why hasn't there been more outrage? Why aren't people, you know, up in arms, holding up their iPhone saying, I don't want you to use this window into my soul? Well, it's, it, you know, the way this works in society, Matt, there has been outrage. For example, 2004, Gmail first went public, and it was the, it was the coolest email application. More storage, more capabilities. Within a week or so, people discovered that their emails were being scanned for content that was being used for targeted advertising. Mm. And there was, there was an explosion of outrage all around the world. And immediately, uh, a California legislator went to work, and she was developing a bill that would have made this illegal. Google mobilized its first war room, where it learned how to resist outrage and transform outrage. And it developed these stages. The first one I call incursion. You just go, go and do what you're going to do, and you wait and see if people get upset. And then if they get upset, the next phase sets in. It's called habituation. You sort of blather along. You tell them things that aren't true. You make apologies. You explain why this really isn't so bad. If there are going to be court suits, you make those court cases go on for as long as possible. After it's a period strategy of time, or is your analysis? It's a strategy. After, it, I say it's a strategy because the incursion, habituation, adaptation, mm -hmm. OK, we'll make a few changes. And then if you wait long enough, redirection, all the things you were mad about come back again in exactly the same form with a new name in a different part mm. of the company. And I have identified these four stages in so many different cases of their behavior, whether it's uh, Street View, Google Glass, Gmail, Buzz that, you know, that became Google Plus, so many things that they've done that, um, that you have to conclude that this is an intentional strategy of how you cope with public mm. outrage, including that rhetoric that says, hey, folks, you know, when the villagers in England came out to block the street view cars, they said, this is a, 
violation of our privacy as a village, as a neighborhood, as individuals. They came to the edge of the village and they, they said, Street View cars will not enter here. Mm. And the head of Street View was a man named John Hankey. He spoke back to the villagers, and I'm paraphrasing now, Matt, but he said essentially, get over it. This is the future. This is the digital. These conflicts have been settled. The decision has been made, and you must stand down. And the Street View cars ran right past the villagers. Guess what he did in the future? One of his great contributions to humanity a few years later was a game named Pokemon Go, run by the same guy, incubated in Google, in the same, with the same people over a period of years, brought to the market as if it were separate from Google, mm. with Google still as the chief investor. And Pokemon Go was one of the biggest experiments that Google has run, learning how to herd people through the city streets toward its guaranteed outcomes, where establishments were paying the game for guaranteed footfall in their businesses. McDonald's, Starbucks, Joe's Pizza, mm. local restaurants, all of them paying the game to learn how to herd people using gamification, rewards and punishments, to herd people mm. into those places where the game would would make money for Google and uh, all the business customers involved in this kind of marketplace without the game players ever knowing about it. Because these systems are always designed to bypass the user's awareness. Mm. So we never see them coming. We never know what they're doing. Which is why you want to call them out. But let me move on to another thing, you know, uh, democracy. Yes. You've touched on that a little bit. To what extent, or rather let me ask basically, how does surveillance capitalism change democracy? This is such a good and important question, you know, and it gets back to the idea that privacy is not something private. A society that cherishes privacy is a fundamentally different society from a society that forces us all to live under a one-way mirror where the bright lights shine on us and we are exposed they know everything about us, but we know nothing about them. So the bottom line here, Matt, is that surveillance capitalism undermines democracy from below, from the roots, but also from above. So let's just talk about that very quickly. From above, it creates a society of intense inequality. In, in the industrial world, the big inequality was economic inequality. And that defined the conflicts of the past century, and rightly so. In our century, the big conflicts are about not the division of labor, not what we do so much and what we earn so much as what we learn, what knowledge we have access to. That determines our life chances in today's society and in information society. Now we enter this new world of an information society marked by these extreme inequalities. But do, we, sorry to interrupt, but do we not know more than we've ever known before, well, thanks to the internet? Yes, and this is what's so confusing about it. So yes, the internet has given us access to all kinds of knowledge, but at the level of our social order and how authority and power are distributed, we now live in a world where See, in 1986, 1% of information was digitalized. In 2013, 98% of information was digitalized. Most of what went digital is all of the information about our lives mm. because we've either put it online or they've extracted it from our lives. So now we have this world where we know almost nothing about them, and they know everything about us. This puts them at the top of the social hierarchy. And we are distracted from this deep new inequality precisely because I can get online and I can, I can look up things that would have taken me a while to look in the encyclopedia or mm. go to the library, but now it's instant. So there's, there's so but much- But how does it harm democracy? All right, well, 
democracy is essentially about a society where we strive toward equality. And that's why economic inequality, economic justice, was the key dimension of social conflict in the last century. Now, we're going to see a new axis of social conflict, where we're fighting for equality of knowing that it's not okay for a small group to know everything about us while we know nothing about them and not nearly as much about ourselves or each other. This puts us at a disadvantage. Why? Because knowledge equals control. And as we've seen, they go over this tipping point. The data scientists call it the tipping point between monitoring and actuation. When you can know so much about a system that it allows you to actually automate that system. Mm. And now what we're moving into is a society where they use this vast wealth of knowledge about us to learn how to tune and herd our behavior remotely, always through the medium of the digital, toward those ends that serve their purposes. Let's talk a minute, if we could, about also how democracy is eroded from below. Mm -hmm. Because as they try to control us, herd us in the direction, as Pokemon Go did, of their commercial outcomes, this is a direct assault on human autonomy. More certainty in, in, intrinsically means less freedom. Freedom is always a wild card. We treasure freedom because it means that we have free will. We decide what we'll do next. We decide what our future will be. We exercise our will. But that gets it very hard to have solid predictions that you can sell as certainty. So more certainty for them means less freedom for us. And that means that autonomy, self-determination, human agency, these qualities that we cherish and without which a democratic society is impossible to imagine, these qualities are always in surveillance capitalism, capitalism sites. So this economic logic is on a collision course with our freedom, our personal freedom, our agency, our will, just as it's on a collision course with our equality mm -hmm. as a society and our ability to have justice and equality over three key questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? And who decides who decides who knows? Those are the questions of knowledge, authority, and power that define the nature, the justice, and the equality of our future. So in China, the answer to that question is the Communist Party in a one-party state decides who decides who knows. Is the Chinese model of surveillance state capitalism, of, of a surveillance society, is that where we're heading towards as democracies in the West? Well, this is, this is such a vital question. And uh, hopefully we'll come back to the issue of law because that's the one thing that mm. separates us from this, from this future. So in China, what we see, as our listeners know, China is an authoritarian state. And it always has been in one way or another. Um, we're talking right now in the cradle of Western democracy in this, in this hallowed city and this beautiful Thanks country. Thanks for the reminder, by the way. Yes. And so, yes, and I'll repeat that to everyone who will listen every day. Mm. This is the cradle of democracy. But, you know, democracy has its highs and lows, and we mustn't forget that. We have to, we have to always mm. fight for it, as our forebears did. Now... <clears throat> China has no democratic heritage, no democratic tradition. It never did. So what the Chinese authoritarian leaders have discovered is everything that we have just discussed, Matt, all these capabilities to know behavior and to control and actuate behavior, these same behaviors, these same, me same mechanisms and methods and capabilities have been developed within the Chinese internet companies the Alibabas, the Tencents, and so forth. And they're being used exactly the same way in what was the private market in, in China. As the Chinese authoritarian state became more aware of these capabilities, they made a decision. And they said, 
That knowledge and the power that accrues to that knowledge is simply too big, too important, too significant for us to leave it in the hands of private companies. We are going to annex those capabilities to the state. And we are going to use those capabilities not simply for commercial outcomes, but for the social and political outcomes that we deem best. And now they are experimenting with how to do that, just as we have experiments like Pokemon Go mm. and the Google Smart City. We have experiments going on in the West. They are experimenting that uh, with these, with this amalgam of, of these new surveillance capitalist capabilities of knowledge and power combined with the state's direction and the state's decision of what the correct outcomes are. That's mm. called this, the Chinese social credit system. And right mm. now it's, it's fragmented and it's experimental, but it's underway. Just briefly, because we've run out of time, um, there's a lot of debate in this country whether to adopt Huawei technology from China. The suspicion is that Huawei, although a private company, has got too many tentacles, or the state has got too many tentacles into it. Is that a legitimate concern, as far as you know? Or should we regard Huawei with the same lack of, with the same degree of suspicion as we regard Facebook or Google? I'm sad to say Briefly. that I'm sad to say that uh, there is there is a cause for suspicion, and because the Chinese state is um, essentially annexing so many aspects of of these companies and their operations and their output, their data, their mechanisms and their methods, that it is worrying. But I have to say, Matt, that perhaps even more worrying is that in the West we think of ourselves as utterly different from China. And yet in the West, we can see some of these same capabilities developing. We've already, certainly the capabilities of the, the Tencent and the Alibaba, we have in ster on steroids in our companies like Google and Facebook and now Amazon, increasingly Microsoft and other parts of the economy. These mechanisms and methods of surveillance capitalism are very robust and far-reaching. And at the same time, uh, we know that they're being used to shape behavior. Mm. And, and now, you know, with facial recognition, with, uh, you know, Amazon has a, the facial recognition system attached to its security systems that it's selling to consumers, encouraging them to buy the app, to link with law enforcement. There are many, many examples where we're also blurring the lines, not only the private sphere overtaking our lives in ways that are completely illegitimate and inappropriate, but private and public spheres merging in ways that are very concerning. In one line, Shoshana Zuboff, can the private individual, as we think we know it, survive this whole revolution? Yes or no? Surveillance capitalists fear one thing, they fear law. The way law will come will be from all of us banding together as collectives, as cities, as neighborhoods, as regions, to understand what is happening to our society and our democracy, to mobilize our lawmakers, and to insist on law. We are democracies. It is the time to mobilize our democratic institutions mm -hmm. and put up the front the time for resistance and combat is upon us. Shoshana Zuboff, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Matt.